How many of you have listened to the Head, Heart, and Boots podcast? I can't tell you that react how much that means to us. Yeah. Welcome back to the Head, Heart, and Boots podcast. I'm Chris. And I'm Brandon. Join us as we wrestle with what it takes to transform ourselves and the businesses we lead. Hey, what's up, dude? All right. Thank you. <laughs> I feel like... You know, I don't know if people have picked up on this, but if you listen to our shows consistently, like 90% of them start with me. And you can tell when Chris is... I think that number's going down, bro. I think it is. Like, we might be... The, the, the needle's moving. I might have uh, 12 starts to my credit uh, by this point. You. And we have 101 uh, original episodes. So what's the math, bro? I, I think don't, it, I don't I, know. I'm getting close to more than 10%. I know. But. Yeah, that was a, it was a very uh, focused and pronun- well pronunciated bro instead of bruh. Did you do that on purpose? Well, are you turning over a new leaf? Uh, seasons change, you know, like <laughs> we're all. Like I'm under no obligation to be the same person I was five minutes ago, it's and uh, things yeah. are changing. That's right. That's right. Okay. Hey, um, so today we're gonna we're gonna experiment a little bit. Yeah. We maybe go a little bit bananas. We we're we bad. normally have like a singular theme. We do. And you know, you and I showed up today, and we're we're absolutely committed to our our studio cadence. Um, That's right. But we don't necessarily have a singular thread today, and so we're gonna play around with a little bit of a. A different kind of episode yeah. and we'd love to hear from you what you think about it um i really uh, i guess one one other thing i would say is i i like joe rogan's podcast i don't like every single episode i don't do every episode the fight companion stuff you know not as much but i think i've really grown to enjoy the organic conversations that yeah. he has and i think that's one of the things that makes him really popular is it's almost like you get to vicariously just listen in on somebody else's conversation and it isn't even so much rogan and who the guest is per se it's just i find it really interesting the topics are normally yeah interesting well they're interesting yeah. right and i and i think what it also too it just reminds me uh listening to those long form podcast conversations is I'm, I'm not alone like we're all the same like they'll one or both of the people will make comments that i'm like oh they think that too you know it's that that yeah. kind of stuff emerges yeah. and I, I just think it's an interesting thing about podcasts and media today that wasn't really a thing at all yeah you know it's like i think it started on tv with the um uh the, the what do they call those i'm not totally spacing it you know like the real housewives of you know la or uh reality shows oh, reality yeah TV. i think i think it started with reality shows and we're like wow this is really weird interesting shocking hilarious to see how other people live yep. and i think podcasts now maybe without all the scripting and drama what was the original do you remember on mtv like the original oh reality it? tv oh, what yeah. was that called well one of i don't know if it was this one but it was real uh wasn't it where they shoved a bunch of people in a big house and yeah big brother no nah, that was later that was later i don't think that was the og <sighs> i forget dude i don't remember. Think my tongue that was Crazy. early days i was a yeah. teenager then that's right um so anyway so we're gonna we're gonna dive into that and we got we got some nuggets we're gonna start with and just kind of see and, and we're just kind of pull back the curtain and you get to whatever if anybody cares listen to a yeah, conversation be a between total us. bomb and we'll know shortly <laughs> oh but wow. before we get going though let's let's thank some sponsors let's thank the people that make this possible let's thank the people um liftify uh we've always got great things to say about them because they always deliver and uh and when there's a glitch, even the CEO jumps on the phone to troubleshoot and mastermind. Um, they really care. They really care. And it shows in the results that they're gaining for their clients. Yep. And uh, it's always fun to work with partners like that. You know, um, they they listen to our input, you know, and and uh, our clients are winning by using Liftify. It's just, it's really fun. It's been a really fun partnership. Highly recommend if you haven't gotten a demo from Liftify, you owe it to yourself and to your team uh, to check it out because even if you're already using some sort of uh, review gen tool, you know, Podium, BirdEye, you know, there's a whole bunch of them. Um, I think you'll be really pleased to see some of the advantages of Liftify. And certainly we've seen the difference in results because we played with those other platforms in the past as we've yep. been operating in, in the industry and, and so have our clients. And there's just a significant uh, upgrade. Um, an increase in results that people are getting from Liftify across the country. One of our clients, we, we've talked about it before, uh, Team Gutierrez, Surpro, they're the number 
one review generator in the whole system. Yeah, a thousand. They just broke the thousand. They broke a thousand, but when they started with Liftify like three months ago at like 540. Yeah. In fact, when they presented, uh, Zach and his team made, they had a custom made trophy built for them as the first serve pro to hit over a thousand reviews. And between the time of them flying in and presenting the trophy, and when they posted the pictures and stuff from this celebration they did, uh, to LinkedIn, I forget who said this, but they added like another 24 yeah, reviews to their are, roster. They're approaching 1100 now or something. Yeah. Like so if you want a team like Liftify working behind the scenes while you sleep uh, to generate and bring in Google reviews that help drive organic inbound leads and phone calls, check out liftify.com forward slash floodlight. That's it. For goodness sake. <laughs> For goodness sake. You know? That's right. Speaking of partners and other partners, uh, Answer Force. Uh, you know, uh, at the end of the day, guys, our businesses are super dynamic. Things are ever changing. Our workflow changes. It comes in spikes. It comes in, uh, you know, influxes based on storm work or seasonal seasonality or just stuff sometimes hits the fan. And one of the cool things about partnering with, uh, an intake, a call intake partner like answer force is it's flexible. You, you ramp it up when, when the need is in the demand is high and you ramp it down, when the demand is is not as high. And so with that flexibility, you've got the opportunity to use it kind of as your company scales, right? It's uh, not just for the small teams. It's it's for the larger, more robust teams. And then there's all those in-betweens. Somebody's on some kind of paternal leave. We've got uh, some influx or some transitioning positions. We've got people that just want to take a break or go on vacation. Uh, there's all these ways that we can partner with a team like Answer Force to just flex our ability to take incoming calls, but always keep it consistent, always keep it professional, and always keep it aligned with what our standard operating uh, procedures are. So answerforce.com forward slash floodlight, learn more about them and what they can do with you. And finally, last, but certainly not least, our friends over at CNR Magazine. You have an interesting article that went out actually this week. And then oh, I yeah. think there's rumors. I think you have one that uh, may be in the next print issue, actually. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's a, That's a good one. Yeah, it's a vulnerable one, you know. <laughs> it was a hard one for me to put out, to be perfectly honest. I talk about crying in it. And... <laughs> You know, that's was, like a good cry article. It was a little uh, bit revealing our magazine, that's not, right. not just a little bit. Um, yeah. And actually what's, what's fun. So go to CNR magazine.com and, uh, and check out some of the latest articles. I think, um, I think this one I just did is in the little sidebar in the most recent or whatever. Yep. And, um, yeah, it's called marrying standards with goals or goals with standards to win. And the fun, like it, I think it's a decent article. Uh, it's fun stuff. But the cover image I generated with AI, and it is really cool. It is really cool. It took me actually a, a while to fidget with the prompts and everything else, but it's really fun. And it's one of those images uh, that you know kind of stops you scrolling in your feed. It's really colorful, and it's just anyway. Yeah, it definitely it's, stands out. It's super cool, yeah. yeah. So people take note of that. But anyways, you guys, CNR Magazine, you guys know we've said it a million times. Michelle and her team essentially friend to us in the industry, right? Not not us as in our team specifically, but all of us as restorers and vendor partners within this very special industry. Uh, man, they just take pride in, in leading and ensuring that good information, that information that we can use, that we can leverage on benefit of our teams uh, is available and consistent and the quality. Uh, I mean, all of it. You've heard it a million times. We just love that team and what they're doing for our industry. Okay, my man, let's let's get into this. Do you? I'm gonna I'm gonna let you launch with the first nugget and see see how things, how things go here. Well, you know it's it's interesting. I I had a couple thoughts. Um, I got a lot, you know, we've talked about this in previous episodes a little bit, just you and I are in a similar stage of life, but you're about four or five years ahead of me in terms of kid ages and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, just kid age. Just make it so, clear. So, <laughs> well, not only, but, but maybe, maybe five is. And stylish, so, good looks. Yeah. About well, four or five years ahead of you there too. Uh, your biceps are, are big too. And I, yeah, it always. Actually, dude, I've got bit. bicep envy right now. We're not even going to get into that, but I have, dude, so we had a client the last time we were on a 
a client on site and he pointed out that your arms were bigger than mine and I haven't been able to get over it. Oh. I, I just can't. I am my I'm soul crushed right now currently. Well, that reminds me of how good it made me feel when he said that. <laughs> I've totally forgot about that. I'm feeling yeah. better about myself it just recalling me off. That. And if he's listening, I want him to know how crushing it was for my spirit. I'm just gonna let that hang there. So speaking yeah. of the gym, uh I was there last night and you weren't, but that's right. That's uh, right. Um, it's <laughs> like oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> thick dps bro that's right um for those of you that know you know video gamers but if you uh, don't yeah you won't so uh yeah so as i was leaving the gym so our gym is in downtown and uh and so you just kind of park wherever it's all these other businesses around it but there's a uh an eye doctor office right behind the gym and they recently started allowing our gym members to park there in the afternoon evening uh, workouts. And so last week, a week before last, I, I parked back to her for the first time. I'm like, gosh, this is convenient. Just walk like 10 steps into the, this is great. And, um, and so I get out of the gym after just running myself into the ground. I walk out the front door, like ha habitually, you know, I have a certain place that I typically have parked for the last like two years. And so I just mosey out like any other night, walk all the way around the block to my usual parking spot. I'm like, well, where the hell's my car? I stand there for a minute. Like, oh, geez. All right. I parked in the eye doctor lot. So I walk all the way around the block to the back of the gym. I find my car and I go home. Last night, I finished the workout again. And uh, I do exactly the same thing. I walk all the way down the block to this other, you know, parking spot that I usually park in. I stand there for a moment, scratch my head. I'm like, where did I park my car? I'm like, in the exact same freaking parking spot as the week before last, you know, when I parked in the new parking lot. And you're like, Nordyke, why in the hell do we give a shit yeah, about this story? This so where is this you? going? And you know what it tipped off in me, dude, is... How habitual all of us are. Yeah. And I find myself, you know, just to be candid, at times getting frustrated in certain situations with our clients or with some of our clients' downline team. You know, we're we're making changes in the business, we're introducing a new process, and we've we've clearly explained the why behind why it's so important and and all this stuff. And yet, you know, we come back to a follow-up session or we come back to a follow-on training and review the what, like progress. And it's like, okay, not much progress, still doing the same old thing. And, you know, we, we teach this to business owners and leaders all the time, the importance of repetition, of cadence, of developing mantras to help us uh, put certain ideas and concepts and standards and, and values in concrete. Yeah. And just how much repetition we talk about creating um, grooves, you know, like we we use the comparison on the freeway, right? How over time the wheel, the tire grooves wear into it, and it almost pulls your car into these ruts. And you know that the analogy with our business, it's important to have those ruts that people can just slide into to adopt a behavior. You yeah. know, yeah. but I think what we don't we underestimate is how much repetition is required. Yeah. And so I know it's a kind of a dumb analogy. It's like, okay, Nordic, well, you could just be your fucking old. Uh, <laughs> this is gray hair coming out. You're forgetting where you parked your car, but I think it's actually, yes, maybe, <laughs> but it's, but it was, it was one of those reminders where I'm like, okay, um, I can't even remember when I've changed the location of my parking spot immediately. Yeah. Like yeah. I have to create a new habit. Yep. And I suspect now that I've talked about it like this, this is going to sort of bake it into the, <laughs> yeah. uh, into my brain. And I probably won't go hunting for my car again. Cause I'm spending so much time thinking and talking about it right now. Um, but, but to me, it was just a great reminder with, you know, our existing consulting relationships and everything else that there is an amount of patience and repetition yep. that is really required as leaders. And I, I guess it's yet another reminder. I don't have patience. Yeah. I don't even have patience with myself. Yeah. You know, yeah. even just the dumb little things. I'm just like, ah, dumbass. You know, I, I have this negative self-talk of duh, you know, but, um, but anyway, I just thought that was a good, a 
good reflection. Um, because it's just something I've been, I've been processing. I've noticed myself having frustration because I think we always in our consulting work, it's one of the, it's just one of the attributes of the job is that you want so you want success for your clients so much. Yeah. And, and I think, sure. and I think part of the position that we're in as consultants, we can, we can see to some degree the road in front of them. Like if they can just lock in this behavior, yeah. if we can just get this pattern or this system in place, like we know, cause we've seen it with so many clients, we've seen it in our own businesses that there's, there's good fruit that's going to come of that. Yeah. And so, and I think as owners and leaders too, like you, you listening to this, whether you're a consultant or not, like you understand that, like you can, you're, you're, you're working with maybe a, a downline team member or somebody that you're mentoring in the business. And they just, it's like over and over again. Uh, it just feels frustrating. Yeah. I think it's an interesting point. I, I, I think one of the things that we forget about when we're, you know, trying to work through some change within the organization or establishing standards, mm -hmm. systems, processes, whatever is in those early phases of that, depending on kind of like where, you know, size and scope of the company, if, you know, like most of us, when we grow our business, a lot of these systems and processes we start to put in place when we notice there's like no more ignoring it, right? Like we've grown through sheer gut, sheer will. We've kind of pulled yeah. the thing out of the dirt, gotten it to a certain state, and now we have to do this. And long story short, though, we forget that change in a business requires behavior modification. And yeah. I think that for some reason we and i do this is we disassociate those two things from each other we we forget that learning that that training somebody to or equipping somebody to do something differently than but like what you're saying habitually they've been doing before it requires behavior modification and the challenge with that is is we're often not training or teaching our people in such a way that we're aware of and we're dealing with or managing Mm -hmm. that behavior modification right so yeah. it's like this we have a conversation with our people yeah. we we share hey we're gonna do this we modified this process and then we make the assumption that our team is on board they get it and they're gonna take care of business and do what we want them to and the challenge is is that they may actually want to but the behavior hasn't been created because we didn't spend enough time in the trench practicing or doing what was necessary yeah. to create that behavior modification. I get frustrated with myself when I don't give myself the time. Like I don't walk through the paces to do something so that I'm changing what I was, you know, the way I thought about it a day ago. Yeah. Uh, and you just, you know, we don't give that enough credit. And I think sometimes it makes us frustrated or it looks like malicious intent or whatever. Yeah. And a lot of times it's just, we've talked about something, but we haven't gone through the steps required to change behavior. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. You know, it, it, it kind of takes me back to that James clear atomic habits thing. And I hadn't really made this connection before, but I think it's probably good for us to realize when we're trying to introduce change in our team or with, I mean, frankly, in our marriage relationship with our kids or with, with anything, you know, um, we're, we're, we're essentially asking that person to become a different person than they were. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like we're like the, the person that we are is really just kind of a collection of repetitive behaviors and reactions and responses. Right. And so when we're fundamentally asking somebody to do their job differently or to prioritize something differently or to value something differently, because it, Hey, this has a, a new importance to the business, or we feel like this could have a really powerful effect on the business. We're, we're essentially asking them to kind of change their mojo, you know, like, yeah. like how they function. And, you know, James clear talks about, you know, when, when we're trying to do that individually, we're trying to make some sort of change or habit change or lifestyle change in our life, whether it's health or it's, you know, um, career or relationships or something like that, that it's, it's really useful to identify an archetype, or, or a, 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 an avatar, um, an example of that, you know, whether that's Chuck Norris or, oh, sure. Uh, like, you, you know, like that uh, Hillary Clinton or whoever, whoever your archetype is, you're like, ah, I, I want to be more like that person. And then to be able to ask yourself, okay, th then the habit formation is going back to that image of that person saying, okay, what would they do in this situation? Right. And there's, there's a, a level of repetition 
yeah. of almost learning how to be that person. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's it, the, for me personally, I've been doing more of that. Like, I don't know that I could tell you the individual, but recently for me, it's been this, this focus on, okay, those personalities, regardless of name, those people that I look to in my past, or maybe that I've had a short term exchange with or interaction with in terms of my sphere of influence are those people that, and you and I have talked about this a bit before that, that show their wisdom through their collective consistency, meaning mm -hmm. that they don't get really amped up. They don't get low. It's just this nice cadence of accountability for themselves, discipline, and just confidence mm -hmm. of, Hey, we're going to make it through this, or we've been here before, or I've done this a million times or whatever the case may be, but it's this wisdom. Yeah. It's this emotional consistency where they certainly recognize when things are good and they certainly recognize when things are a challenge, but emotionally they're not reacting or posturing to marry up yeah. against some of that stuff. And so it's like listening to what you're talking about or kind of just going back to this whole behavior modification. I've really wanted to, I'm trying to, to keep in my mind, like those people that, that posture, that demeanor that I have prescribed with or equated to wisdom yeah. and uh and just trying to mirror or mimic more of that in my own personal life i mean it was like all of us like our business is challenging just like everybody else's our home lives all the things and my kids you know uh, i love them both they still do things that really frustrate me i do things myself that frustrates me mm -hmm. um and i'm just trying to get better at just walking that line of just consistent emotional response to these things not the reacting, not the thing. But anyways, where I was going with that is it, it's hard. It's it's hard for that to move from a thought or a um, an intent for it to become actual behavior modification. Mm -hmm. And and quite honestly, I'm not entire, entirely sure what I can do to speed up the learning process. Mm -hmm. But it's just a matter of I'm, I felt myself walking this transition from sucked at it completely yeah, uh, everything I was doing was fairly subconscious. Then there was like a, you know, once you see it, you can't unsee it. And so I would catch myself more in the rear view mirror, like a situation's over and I'm like, ah, oh, that didn't really go the way I would have wanted it to. Yeah. And then I moved into a place where more often, let's put it that way, I'm catching myself before I react. And now I've kind of feel like this plateau where I'm, I don't know how to make that better. I, I don't yeah. know how to make the pace what am I trying to say there? I don't know how to, to intentionally create more exposure or to move that needle faster in terms of how often I can then just prevent mm -hmm. from me even sliding into that mental state, let alone trying to buffer a response, yeah. but mm -hmm. just not going there. Like how do I mentally transition into being emotionally more consistent and more leveled out? Um, anyways, I kind of, I think yeah. maybe steered the, that behavior mod into a different direction, but that's just where I am personally, I think in relationship to the whole behavior mod thing. Yeah. Well, and, and I also, I guess realized to you just how much our thoughts, like the stories in our head, um, yeah, the shoulds that come up get in the way of us really creating change. Like we can just slip into this thing of they should be able to get it after the third time I've yeah. said it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like that ego comes out and and I just, I realized the power of my thoughts that affects my attitude and, and it's so easy for my, my ego to reinforce my attitudes, Yeah, you know, with yeah. those kind of comments, like we've had this gosh dang conversation twice now, <laughs> they should have their shit together, you know, rather than considering why don't they have their shit together? Like is what's standing in the way? What is standing in the way? And, and is it possible? Like, I think we're all different and every situation's different. And I think some changes for whatever reason are more difficult for us than others. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It, and I, I think that's why the, you know, one of the reasons, and I don't know if we have always thought about it super intentionally, yeah. but I think it's one of the reasons why we use that language a lot of hey, what are we doing to memorialize this training or, yeah. or to memorialize this date that we're agreeing that X has been accomplished or that X has been done yeah. and the importance 
of that. Um, you know, I think one of the ways that we've talked about it in the past is creating a clear line in the sand where we can look at it and say, Hey, yeah. before today I was this, right. I did this process. I owned this, whatever. Yeah. Now though, I'm this, I'm, I'm in alignment with this system, this yeah. process. I'm a different, I know what I didn't mm. know yesterday. I know today. Yeah. And the ability of creating a real intentional memorialized point yeah. in the sand, if you will, right, really helps us, I think, internally go, okay, mentally I'm buying in that I now know this process yeah. versus just a passing conversation or a quick meeting and then hoping that that translates, you know, into behavior yeah. change. Um, yeah, I, I just, I, my whole, my whole thinking dude has been shifting in this area because I, I, when I, when I explore kind of the things that frustrate me and, um, kind of get me in that headspace, it's, it's usually my ego that's driving it. Sure. You know, yeah. I'm not getting what I want from this person and I feel like I shouldn't have to put more in. You know what I mean? Yeah. Total ego. Yeah. It's 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 not in that moment if if I'm if I'm not careful in that moment it has nothing to do with the success I want for that person or that team or that whatever. It's really about somehow it's about me. I'm disappointed in what they're bringing, but I'm not asking the question what could I be bringing that would help that transition or help them make that that change. Now of course I, I get there's there's a lot and this is the confusing part about business right and relationships and leadership is there there is this it's like the yin and yang of things there there are scenarios often where the person just doesn't have the skill or the personality for the particular thing we're asking them to do or um the desire or inclination and so we all have the experience of wanting something more than the other person wants it and it's like when do you where do you find that line i think sometimes that's really tricky it's like you know this 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 line where one as a leader recognizing this person clearly needs more support or help to make this transition more reminders more repetition more training more role playing whatever it is to hmm we've done this seven eight times at what point do you pull the ripcord? Yeah. That, and that is, that is the hard thing. We talk about like relative to like terminating people. We talk about the three rules, you know, did I provide them enough training? Did I give them enough time to make that change? Um, and did I document, has there been, ha, have I, have I created clarity around this issue with them? Clear feedback. Yeah. Clear feedback. Right. Um, but even then, you know, I think that's just one of the things that as leaders we carry, like that's part of the burden we carry is, trying to discern right when when we've given enough or when we've given all that we can you know allocate to that person yeah it's it's interesting i remember years ago going through um this was a long time ago now we went through a program where we were learning top down uh was it top down hiring or top something? grading top grading i think so yeah something along those lines essentially it was this idea of what can you do in your interviewing and onboarding process to do a better job of identifying that whole hungry, humble, smart, you yeah, know, that, a successful that, like profile of a yeah. person that's going to be successful in our company. Right? Yeah, exactly. And and it's like, you know, as Lencioni kind of points to in, in, in their writings in terms of, uh, you know, that whole hungry, humble, smart is at the end of the day, there's not a ton of industry where the technical competency, the, the technical knowledge is make or break for the role. In most cases, people learn stuff, right? Yeah. Like if we really boil it down, like people can learn new things. Oh, yeah. And when the posture is correct, meaning they're humble, they're coachable, right? They're hungry, meaning they want to learn, they want to advance, they don't need you to pull them. Yeah. Um, and then that whole smart being centered around this social awareness, like how I act affects the people around me. So I want to act in a way that's more effective, right? Mm -hmm. Hungry, humble, smart. When you have that raw clay to begin with, in most cases, people can learn the tech stuff mm -hmm. and, and really win because all those internal markers are set to learn, to engage, to take in information, to behavior, yeah. to modify behavior. 
it, you know, so anyways, wh- one of the things I just realized is how bad I still am with that, with, with the getting to being able to really identify the whole hungry, smart, hungry, humble, smart element, and then marrying that with, okay, there's got to be some level of competency depending on the role. So example, key leader roles. Yeah. Can we teach them quite a bit about the business? Yeah. But I can't teach them everything there is about leadership. Otherwise, they're not going to be ready to take on the role, right? But anyways, my point is, is that I'm still trying to figure out as an employer, um, as a consultant, um, how do we ask the kinds of questions that help us identify that. Because kind of going back to where this conversation started is, if we're going to be confident enough to give our people what they need to move through those learning gaps or those training gaps, we need to have some element of a foundation. Oh, right? yeah. So we can't be questioning all the things, yeah. the give a shit, the, the, you know, the humility levels, the, you know, are they driven at all? Yeah. Like we can't have all of those being variables in the same equation. Otherwise we won't be able to come up with an answer. Yeah. You know, and so just I'm trying to learn how to identify those folks better in those early phases. We've been super fortunate. Um, you know, knock on wood, um, our internal team, I mean, I can't tell you how many times a week you and I have texts, right? Or I have a text exchange with Jana or another part of the team of just how proud we are. Yeah, of of the hires that we've had the honor to make and and the people quality that of people, yeah. But I mean, we were fortunate because they're kind of like the best of everything. Not yeah. only are they hungry, humble, and smart, but then they're all like technically ridiculously competent. Yeah. And so it's not like, um, I mean, if we're just being honest, like we were fortunate. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, we, we knew some of these people. We got yeah. fairly lucky. Lucky. Yeah. Yeah. We did. We didn't necessarily do it all just through our awesome questioning ability. Well, and I think it's getting harder because I, I think one of the ways, if we had any role in it, you know, how much of it was luck, how much of it was our approach, you know, with looking for people and bringing them on. I don't know. I think it was mostly luck. It feels like, but just the the caliber of folks we ended up with, but we also took our time. We did. And, and it, that's an interesting, I think you could say argument right now within HR and recruiting is, um, you know, there's a lot of complaining by candidates. I mean, right now it's a candidate's world. It's a job hunter's world right now. It really is. I mean, in, in a major way. Uh, and so there's a lot of complaining on the part of applicants and candidates about just how long and drawn out the interview process is and this, I, I've seen stuff on LinkedIn periodically about, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm going in for my fifth interview, you know, and they, now they're having me meet with, you know, whatever, the field manager and holy cow, you know, I'm taking time off of work for every single one of these, that, that kind of thing. And so there's certain HR leaders that are talking about how ridiculous and unfair and, and unprofessional that is for companies to have such a long extended process. And I'm like, well, yeah, I can understand that maybe as a job hunter that that feels that way at the same time, part of me is like, don't you as a candidate want to know? I mean, I get that we all have to pay our mortgage, you know, most of us do. Yeah. I, I get that like there, there's an urgency that we feel when we're hunting for our next gig. Yeah. Um, so I, I understand that, but at the same time, the way I think you and I've always looked at interviewing is a two way interview. Yeah. Like we don't want to just persuade and cajole somebody to come yeah. join our team. The and goal is not to sell them. No, right? no. The goal is to come to a meeting of the minds and be like, does this feel right for you? Does this feel right for us? Okay, let's let's run. Let's yeah. let's do this. And I think that's more or less how you and I, you know, yeah. have handled uh recruiting, certainly especially for, you know, leadership figures and and so forth. So I part of me feels like you need just a certain amount of time and grade with somebody. You know, I think that's interesting. Uh, you're right. To like, identify that stuff. Yeah, I think you do. But I think the key is, or this opinion, is when someone acts as if, and acts meaning not playing or faking, but is carrying themselves in such a way that's communicating in such a way that you're wanting to learn about the individual, and we're saying that. Like we're communicating, hey, you know, 
our hiring process is not super fast, but here's why. Yeah. You know, uh, here's our intent. Here's, yeah. here's why it's so important for you, uh, you to have the time for you to meet multiple key leaders in our company yeah. and interview with them because you're interviewing as much as we are you. Right. Mm -hmm. But I think the challenge, the difference between that and what we normally do is we're just doing a bad job of following up and communicating with people. It It's not necessarily the too many interviews, although I have heard that, but I almost just wonder if there's a reality of, you putting the brakes on and leading that process, explaining why, what's why it's important for them and us, may keep that conversation more mutual. Like it might may hold val more value. You Dude, know? I love that. I think that's it's really good wisdom. You know, I mean, in, in a lot of ways, that's that's kind of falls to the same principle as like why we do the restoration checklist with clients. Yeah. It's like if we if we let them know, hey, there's going to be some stressful bits or maybe some frustrating points in this process ahead. It 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 almost never feels as weighty and as hard when that shows up because yeah. it's like, well, we talked about this, you know. So the, the same principle is set a good expectation, you yeah. know. Is and I think probably I certainly have failed to do that in the past. Of of um, it, it's almost like we modulate as we go and if we're not quite feeling it then we do another interview and another interview and all of a sudden the, the 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 candidate's tired out yeah and or irritated or offended or or whatever versus if we just said hey it's very likely we're going to need a series of three or four meetings for us to get to know each other and the intent is for you to also be able to like if we had unpacked if yeah. you unpack that on the front end yeah um you know then i think uh maybe that um, makes it feel more professional and, and, and whatnot. You know, another thing about hiring, I, I've been sitting in on um, a handful of interviews lately with sales candidates for, for some of our clients. And, you know, one of the themes I've been seeing, and I've been seeing it reported on and HR people writing about it in the, you know, internets and so forth, there's there's been a real trend of millennials and generation nexters who whatever we call them now um hopping jobs every couple of years like it's becoming more the norm you know whereas like my grandfather worked at the same place for 36 years yeah. my dad taught for 32 years my mom nursed 34 years um my wife you know has been 22 years um and that hasn't been my story, you know, uh, but, but I've had a number of different intervals of, you know, five, six, eight years, whatever. And, and it's interesting as a recruiter, as, uh, as an owner, as a, as a leader that hires people, I tend just instinctively to favor people that have resumes where they've been in somewhere for 10 years, yeah. eight years, six years three years, under three years, there's a certain amount of skepticism or cynicism sure. I'm applying yeah. to that applicant, especially if I see multiple stints of under three years. And I was thinking about that. I mean, cause this is becoming very normal and uh, on kind of a cynical side, I've seen TikToks, I've seen blog posts, I've seen medium articles of like millennial professionals talking about why uh, i mean basically they're they've learned strategically that they can level up their career every two years by hunting for a job routinely and they do it systematically like yeah. I, I put in my two years here i develop some highlights a highlight reel of yeah. the things i've done and then i go and i leverage that uh to get a 20 percent raise or to go get stock options or whatever I've seen many, many millennials. It seems like mostly millennials and and younger. Um, and, and I think, I think it's true. I think in some ways, us as employers, we we feed that as we look for talent. We're we're willing to buy talent, and so we we kind of feed into that to some degree. I think probably the tech industry drives that more than anybody else because yeah. it's just so such enormous rapid growth and high margins and everything else. And all of us just sort of bear the consequence of that, that culture. But, um, but the, here's the other thing that I've, I've noticed too, if I step back and 
think about it. The people that were at a role for 10 years, it doesn't actually mean they have what we, what right. we want. You right. know what I mean? Yeah. Like the fact that they, like the things that we associate with, they were at this job for 10 years. Uh, I, I think I, re, I instinctively think, well, they have years of developed skill in that space. They, they have stick to right? They're diligent. You know, we assign a lot of values to that. You were at a place for 10 years. Yeah. Wow. You know, or, or even more so at, like on LinkedIn, how you can see like they started out as a sales rep, then they became a yeah. sales manager and now they're an operations manager at GM. And you're like 12 years, you know, and you're like, okay. But the reality is, is just like sometimes those jumpers that, that change every two years uh, have sort of a superficial, shallow uh, sense of responsibility and loyalty and all that kind of stuff. The people that have been in a place for 10 years, sometimes it's because they were just comfortable. Yeah, They weren't growing. Yep. They weren't looking for a challenge. They weren't trying to level themselves up, let alone the business that they were working for. Yeah. And they were just comfortable. Yep. And likewise, I've encountered some people that do the two every two years job thing, and they're just killers. They're just, they're hungry and they are leveraging the system, but they're bringing maximal value. You know, yeah. so we see that too. And I, so it's just reminding me of my, the biases, if I'm not careful that I can bring just by looking at the resume. So one of the things I, I periodically will remind myself to do is I don't look at a resume before I talk to somebody because I don't want to know. You know what I mean? So we talk about like identifying the hungry, humble, smart. Sometimes it's really freaking hard because you have these competing, this competing information. You look into their resume, what their track record is on paper, what they've chosen to show about themselves. Yeah, that's a good point. Versus how you experience them live. Yeah. And so I don't know if that's right or wrong. It's just something I've been I, I've been experimenting with lately. Is I and and almost every time our clients will send us a resume ahead of time, and I've I've more and more been not looking at it. Yeah. And instead having me give them or having them give me their narrative. Hey, you know, tell me tell me about yourself. I have your resume, but I want to just instead I want to come in fresh. Yeah. You know, talk to me about your trajectory. What brought you here? What has you interested in this role? And then diving back and exploring, you know, how they got to here. But um, I just, it's, it's interesting how much our own brains, just our habitual, the way we see the world, the way our collective experiences, the biases it brings us, uh, it, it gives us or that we bring to our decision-making and the way we approach stuff. Um, I think, a ton, we just don't realize it until we do. Yeah. Right. I, I and, and along those same lines, well, it's really not. It's just sort of random, random rabbit trail. So I was driving home yesterday. I had that whole parking thing where I lost my car. Dude, where's my car? <laughs> um, and I get home and I'm getting out of my car and there's this dude uh, with uh, no shirt on. He's probably 50s fit, not like Instagram fit, but he's fit. He's clearly fit has muscles where they belong, you know, and like, and, and he's just full out drenched in sweat as though he'd just run a, a marathon length run. He has one of those hydration vests on with the little water bottles on him. And he's actually got a sweatband. So he's clearly in his fifties, you know, a man that uh, sort of matriculated in the eighties, he's got this sweat band and anyway, he's just getting after it. And so I just out of respect, I'm like, Hey dude, putting in the work, huh? He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, bro, but having fun too. And I was like, that, <laughs> yet another good reminder, man. I'm just having all these moments of pause where I'm like, having fun. Well, bullshit, you're not having fun, dude. You just like sweated your guts out running on pavement. That's not fun. I hate running. I absolutely hate running. I Running is one of my least like desirable activities that I could possibly engage in. And I'm really into fitness. I can't stand running. And so it was just, it, he gave me this moment of pause. I was standing there with the door of my car open for, I'm not kidding you, probably 20 or 30 seconds, just thinking about and having fun. You're like, no, you're not. And <laughs> how can any fun? I'm like, how often do I like 
grit and grind myself to do a thing that I'm that I don't really want to do. And I just I just occupy that headspace of you know, like 75 hard, you know, I think this, there's a mindset where we, and I'm not necessarily saying it's wrong, but I think today there's a lot of talk about discipline and, and we, and we talk about a lot, you know, I've been thinking about a lot, but uh, there's almost like a a new, a fresh glory in suffering like the David Goggins. Yeah. That there's value in just the suffering and his comment just made me reflect on Yes, I think I need to lean into suffering. There's something important about like producing, like intentionally pursuing suffering and hardship in our lives, yeah. especially just the easier our lives get. The more money we make, the, all the things like that's there's something really important about struggle, you know. But his comment, it just really made me think, God, do, it, is it possible for me to shift my attitude and actually get more pleasure out of those things? You know what I mean? Yeah, I do. While while still while still eating that important vitamin of struggle. Yeah. You know, it's like uh, it doesn't mean that I'm gonna choose a more pleasurable activity. It's just is is it possible that I'm making it the suffering greater because of the attitude or the mindset I have about it? Yeah. You know? Yeah, I kind of I, I feel like in many ways that's played itself out in some of our exercise stuff. Yeah. Like physical fitness routine is, you know, I I think earlier in the year, you know, before I was kind of off the wagon again there for a bit. And in that inconsistent state, I think I had started to slide more into the focusing on the parts about it I don't like and 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 embracing the suck, yeah. if you will, versus yes. Actually, I kind of like working out, really. I feel good about you myself I mean? when I do this, yeah. Yeah, like just kind of really sliding into that, I do this because I need to. I do this because I'm disciplined. And you kind of do suck the fun out of it. And it may not have been all that necessary. Yeah. I think, too, it's like it turns, it can very easily turn things into just almost like guilt, like guilt, shame. I I don't know how, I don't think a lot of times I go into it intentionally thinking it from that perspective, but when it's all about embracing the hard shit and the grind and the suck and all the stuff, there is part of it. It just kind of slides into a negative mindset. Like it's just, just constant state of doing things because it's hard or doing stuff because it's the, not the easy path. And I do kind of want to still have some fun in there. Like I, I want my life to be fun. I want to embrace the positive parts about that, I guess. Yeah. We have, I don't always know how, but I, I don't either, but it inspired me, you know, when yeah. he said that and, and I believed it. He wasn't just a bullshitter. You know, yeah. you know, you, when people say things, you just kind of know and they mean it and he, yeah. he meant it. And I thought, shit, I think there's something there for me, you know? Okay. So this is, I, believe it or not, I actually think there's a tie in to some of this stuff. So <laughs> So I was, um, I was thinking a, a little bit about like, sp- right, right at the beginning of the conversation, you're talking about you know, things that reminded us of behavior modification, that relationship, this, this mindset against like these circumstances or scenarios that we're in. And kind of reminds me of this theory of creating a coaching culture. You and I have talked about this just kind of sporadically before, but it's this idea of creating an environment, um, where, you know, ultimately in quotes, we've done such a good job marrying accountability and relationship that we actually have an environment where people are always calling each other up. Mm. Right. And, and it's, it's interesting because if you just think about kind of this trajectory of some of these tidbits that we've talked about, I'm using a Chris word there, tidbits. Um, no, it was actually, it was jot and tittle. Oh, jot and tittle. That's a whole nother layer. That was a, that was a new terminology we yeah. introduced a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Jump that far into the deep end. Dude. Yeah. Get, get it together. Real. But it's, it's just kind of this idea of when we create an environment where it's matured to a certain point where our exchanges with the people around us, like I've been doing this a lot with my kids recently and honored to do so. We've obviously do it with our own staff. And then we, as coaches and consultants, we do it as part of our partnership with our clients. But it's this idea of beginning to create the kind of environment where we can have hard conversations, point difficult things out that don't always have specifically something to do with a task or a job responsibility, but more of looking at the person as a person 
and 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 having a more mature conversation. So like example, you, these scenarios that you've already talked about where you know we get frustrated sometimes because when we're training a new employer, training somebody, it's just not like there's not the behavior modification that we want or talking about like our mentality around some of these hard things that we have to do. And what's interesting is that you and I can have a conversation about it and learn and there's really no expectation to not be learning in the conversation as we kind of go back and forth on a topic, but we don't really have that in our professional relationships as it, as it stands with work and our teams, like in the sense that it feels like I'm either trying to always talk you into something or shift you into coming into alignment with something I want mm -hmm. versus learning about people and asking hard questions and being able to then reflect for them some of the things that we see as we interact with them, not just regarding job performance. Like you did X, you needed to do Y. I mean, obviously there's that feedback, Yeah. but are you tracking I with, think so. with what I'm saying? Like it's, it's weird how we feel this discomfort around let's say a comment like that. Let's say I have somebody that's talking about how hard it is to learn how to do X mm. and being able to say, what do you think makes you think that? Like, what is it that mm. you believe like drives that state of mind? Yeah. And do you think that that actually stands in the way of you being able to learn some of these things? Like how much of that is just negative self-talk that you've learned to tell yourself yeah. that actually has no bearing on reality mm. and just see how that changes. Cause this is freaking weird, dude. So, I'm not shitting you. This was years ago. I had somebody. Oh, this is so trippy, actually. That this is popping up. I had a scenario with a downline employee that kept coming in over and over in the initial parts of our, our relationship saying that they were horrible at X. They would just say it all the time. Oh, I'm just terrible at X. I'm Oh, I'm horrible at X. Mm -hmm. And somebody reminded me. I can't remember who. This may have been Amy. Amy reminded me, she was like, hey, you know, you can have influence on their perspective of what they're good and bad at. I said, what? What are you talking about? Right. And this was like, uh, you know, employee coaching 101, right? Yeah. Or probably 501 coming from Amy. But the point which she made to me is watch what happens. She said, try this. She said, over the next several weeks, when that person, when you see them, talk about an example or point out that you actually think they're very good at X. And watch what happens. And I am not kidding you, dude. I did a social experiment with one of our people. After about five or six weeks of me every couple of days catching them doing something or in the hallway, it's going to sound like this was like totally uh, like repetitive to the point where they picked up on it. Nope. I played it out subconscious. I would just say, oh man, nice work with XYZ. I knew you were dialed in on that. I knew you, you were actually good at that. And I just keep walking. Don't get caught in a conversation. Few days later go by, something happens. Hey, dude, nice work on the XYZ. I really appreciate how you had that. I knew you were good at that. And I did this. I'm not shitting you for like five or six weeks, if I remember correctly. And by the end of it, that individual came into my office and was using language like, Yeah, I actually really like doing XYZ. I'm pretty good at it. I'm not, dude, I'm not kidding. It was the trippiest thing I had ever experienced. And and it worked so well, I haven't done it since. <laughs> Isn't it? funny just how complicated and yet simple we are oh yeah i i, I think that just remind i find that I inspirational yeah to be honest because what what that story tells me is all of us are capable of great change by simply changing the inputs yeah you know, like you, this was this was an example of you helping some helping influence somebody else by your behavior. Yep. Right. And it had a positive effect on their perception of themselves. That's right. Uh, which changed their thoughts about a particular uh, skill or tradecraft or task or responsibility. And it completely changed their perception of it. Yeah. Which is just remarkable to me. Yeah. Yeah, it's so exciting. It's interesting too because, you know, kind of following that same track of thought, I for years, for years, I would say out loud, I'm I'm not good at strategy. I'm not a strategic thinker. Mm. I'm a I'm a general, meaning 
that like I want to just command the troops. Nuts and bolts. What's the big mission? Okay, got it. I'm I'm a field general. I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna command the troops. We're gonna lead them. We're gonna act. Because you are good at that. I, and I like it. Yeah. I, I do like that level of integration with my key leadership and my team. But just this reality of me for years and years saying, well, I'm not a strategic thinker. I'm not actually good at strategy. I'm not mm-hmm. whatever. And it's just not true. I mean, I just had a couple people in my life that 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 questioned that, that didn't that didn't no. believe me, basically, that said, you know, they affirmed in me those times where I was talking about or we were working through strategy or brainstorming around strategy. And I and I had a couple people that consistently enough told me, yeah, actually, you're really good at that similar situation, right? It's so uh-huh. funny. I, here I have this subconscious example internally of what I did with somebody else externally. But that really shifted my mindset. And more recently, it's funny because now when I think about our company and a lot of the things that we do now, I love strategic thinking. I love going oh, to yeah. the table and thinking big picture about what we need to do and and what those outcomes could potentially be. And what a dramatic shift from this mindset that I had shared for so long with myself of you're not good at X. And once someone convinced me that maybe I actually am pretty good at it, it was just like a 180 degree turn. Yeah. And now you'll hear me often say things like, I love strategy. That's my favorite part. I like digging in and, and getting into the strategy. Well, it's like it's like 90% of what you and I do together. Yeah. And, and, you know, so I, 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 yes, I agree. It's just, it's funny, just a simple change in how we see ourselves or the thoughts that we have. It's, it's profound. It's really all this stuff, dude, has gone from several years ago to very woo woo kind of think about it internally. Don't want to say it out loud Yeah. to now. I think you and I, both of us, um, in different ways, in different contexts are just realizing over and over and over again, the way that we're thinking about something. Yeah. The way that we think about things in our business, we think about our people, we think about priorities, the way we think about relationships, it's kind of everything. It is. Because it drives our action. It is. You know, getting getting right thinking about something uh, in some cases can make the action very effortless. Yeah. Once we get the right thoughts about it. Yeah. You know, I, I so, and maybe this is a, a good wrap up, I don't know, uh, but I, um. I was watching a, a story, a video story that came through my feed. Um, there was a, a guest that I remember hearing either on Tim Ferriss or Joe Rogan. His name's Roland Griffiths. Roland Griffiths, he's a, a lot of people have heard about um, the psychedelic research that that's taking place like John Hopkins and, and um, uh, the Mayo Clinic and stuff around yeah. like uh, helping soldiers with PTSD yep. and PTSD. stuff like that. Anyway, yep. he's a big drama. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so Roland Griffiths is a, a big-time researcher in that space for many, many years. Been a leader in it, and um, he very interesting guy. He's like seventy, I think. Well, he just died two days ago, and this story was an interview with him about two weeks before his death. Interesting. And of course, part of his research is helping people like terminal cancer patients yeah. using psilocybin and some of these things to really ease the. Um, the process of dying, you know, and the anxiety and the, and the dread that yeah. people can experience when they're facing death. And, uh, and so that's a big area of his research. Well, now he's the guy who's dying. He had colon cancer, stage four colon cancer when he was diagnosed or stage five, even when he finally got the diagnosis. And I just thought what he said was so fascinating. He said, you know, when, when I got my diagnosis, everything changed for me. He said, all of a sudden I had this sense of clarity and eventually joy. And the guy, the interviewer said, joy, how, you know, and I imagine the interviewer was expecting some sort of, you know, spiritual answer, or I'm going to, I'm going to meet my savior or some sort of existential, you know, thing. And, and he said, well, because I, it's every day I sort of realize that instead of this cancer diagnosis, I could have been hit by a truck and it have been all over. And I wouldn't have had any of these last experiences with my wife and my family, all the dinners we've had together and we've shared together. It's pure joy. I'm still around. Every day I wake up and it's Thanksgiving that I get one more morning 
to have with my wife, to read, to do the things that I enjoy. And I just thought, and, and you could just tell he meant every sentence of it, yeah. you know, yeah. like you could just see it. And his wife, you know, she wasn't like, uh, you know, there's none of that. Yeah. Yeah. She she just uh, for those of you listening, I just turned my head like, what the, what the hell, honey? What yeah. you enjoy? You know, like his wife was was agreeable with it. I mean, it was just it was beautiful. It was it was a beautiful interview. She was just nestled against him. They were just sitting there. They'd been married like forty some years, and they're essentially preparing to say goodbye. Then they just said goodbye two days ago, and again, I just think that's a, another affirmation that we get to choose. We get to choose. Yeah. We get to choose how we're going to think about things. Yeah. And that might be the most powerful choice that any of us has, is how we choose to think about things in every way and in every area of our life. Close it there. Um, better. <laughs>